Okay, um, just before you start, just some, some intro. So that's the a novel setting. So the room change was not planned, right? That's not part of the surprise you have every week, but hopefully we'll see. Um, but the idea is that um, this flipped classroom store concept begins today, right? So William has been preparing uh, a paper, uh, sorry, a, a topic rather, or security awareness, and will give us an you know, introduction to that area and with specific focus on that paper that, uh, um, you know, we agreed to on choosing in a way and has been published and I saw some of you had a look at it. So that's part of your contribution of that course is firstly to attend, yes, well done, thank you, but also to ask questions about uh, the lecture in general, but more specifically with respect to uh, the paper uh, and in particular the methods aspect because you guys are not required to be familiar with security awareness, of course, because you're your own stuff to work on and your own stuff to write reports on, but you need to train your ability to critically assess, right? So and that's something uh, where, where you come to play. So and that feeds into William's, uh, you know, three points or implicitly. So for the first part of the session, uh, William will just be talking about the topic um, and then we'll have a discussion on the specific uh, uh, paper. But um, I understand, so we, we just um, talked before and uh, William agrees that um, you can ask it's like a lecture. Ask questions anytime. You don't understand something, want more clarification, or want to inject something for discussion, I guess. Uh, just to make it you know, a bit like a classroom experience, because that's something what you want to get away from the clip, flipped experience, that you are actually kind of the teacher and have the, the bearing, the suffering. But nevertheless, we train this in, 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 the, in a very friendly atmosphere, I guess, right? So there's no intent of, of uh, it, the intent is to learn something from it. So that's, that's kind of should be your objective when participating in this uh, um, session. Cool. Um, we have a special guest here today. That's uh, Matsaya from the uh, Department of Information Security. Uh, Matsaya is here because, uh, first of all, um, he is interested in serious games and he's currently developing a framework for the analysis of serious games in the context of cybersecurity and for design. So he kind of has, has an you know, interest but also a competence in this very area. So that's why I invited him. I thought, okay, you know. Perhaps we can mutually learn from each other, or you know, perhaps he has some suggestions or questions, or you know, at least we take something away from it. So that's why you see a slightly unfamiliar face here. But I hope I can uh, groom them to become a more regular participant as well. Um, but he uh, unfortunately will not have the obligation to write the report at the end. So, <laughs> <laughs> so cool. I think at this stage, um, with everyone reasonably comfortably seated and their popcorn handy, um, I've I hand the floor to you, so it's uh, it's over to you, William. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, give you a little a short introduction of myself because I haven't been to any of the classes before. Um, William White. Um, I started my information security career back in the 1900s when I was in the military, <laughs> and um, it's I, I worked with um, cryptography for the most part. So if you understand how planes try to talk to other planes and without being intercepted by enemy planes. I work with that, and the, the combat communications use cryptography in order to speak. So that's where I basically started my career. After the military, I went into this, I worked for the state of New York, and they also needed information security because, of course, that's when the net, like the LAN and WAN networks were starting up really big, and they started to realize that, hey, you know, people can see our passwords, or hey, people can get our information. We need somebody to start taking care of that. So a lot of what I did was computer hardening. I did some web um, web security and things of that nature. Um, came overseas to Norway. Really liked it here. So I decided to take a job with Plan International, which was really, really good. They also needed security, so I became their CISO for a while. Um, I have some discussions about that because they weren't prepared for security at, at that point. They had a very different idea of what security was, and I'll make some points about that later. I worked for the Noshka Tanlega Planning, and they, again, had some very strange ideas about security. So now I work for ABB, um, AS, and um, International, and they're very much, they're a lot better about security. I'll say one thing about ABB, they use a lot of money for security. They have no problem spending money, and you'll probably never hear that anyplace else, because I'm telling you, everybody else, the bottom line is do it cheap. Um, I don't know if anybody else has been professionally in the field. Is anybody anybody working or anybody worked with security? No, mostly students or? I hope that I can keep this exciting for you, but it's information security, so I assure you that I cannot. <laughs> um, topics, um, the history of security awareness, 
problems concerning security awareness, which is actually the bigger topic, and that's really where I'm going to focus most of what I discuss. Uh, contributions of security awareness, some theories, and then we can get into the paper introduction and where we're going with the paper. Okay. And if, uh, like um, we'll say it stated earlier, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in because this is this is a uh, when you talk about security awareness, and I've had to do a couple of security awareness classes on both sides. It really does help everybody when people bring up their points. So please keep that in mind. Oops, sorry. The history of security awareness. Here you can you can just read through that a little bit. But actually security aware or security awareness and security training actually started in the military. I mean you hear about Caesar using ciphers and things of that nature. And it was just to keep secrets from people that you didn't need to have that, that didn't need to know. What, what each um, side was doing. So that was the most important part about it. I mean, other than that, there wasn't any use for it before then because everything was pretty much open. Um, we, when we talk about security, we're basically talking about risks and being conscious of risks. And it's, it's a very, very important topic. Most people, when they talk about security awareness, they're talking about end user training and things of that nature. But that's not what the crux of it is. The most important part is making people conscious of risk. That, that's really, really big. And another goal of information security is just to let people know what they're susceptible to, which, which types of threats are out there, and more, and more importantly, what they should be able to do about threats. In a room like this, most people have worked, with, have worked with the internet, they've worked with computers, they've worked with some programming, but most of the people in offices that, that are securing the most important things have no idea what we're talking about. And we, we tend to lose sight of that. And we have to really understand what we have to convey to people and to understand what they feel about what we're trying to convey. Very, very important. Is there any questions on that? OK, because that's a very, very important point. And I'll be stressing that um, throughout this talk. Nine generally accepted, pro, uh, accepted principles of security awareness. Of course, awareness, which we've just discussed. Responsibility and risk assessment, I'll, I'll skip past because I will, I will talk about those a little bit later in depth. But um, response, when we talk about response, we're talking about incident response for the most part. And there's a lot of situations where people have, have a problem with their computer or they, they might spot a virus or they've clicked on something that they shouldn't have clicked on and they want to do something but they just don't know what to do. Most places can set up a good response for, for like I'm um, calling the help desk or calling a certain person to make sure that these things are taken care of. But not all people do that. And if you're a person who's sitting at your computer and you know there's something wrong with it, but you just don't know what to do, you're, you're risking everybody around you. And it's a really important thing. Like most people don't know, the first thing you should probably do is unplug your computer from the network. Now, that's easy when it was a Cat5 cable. But when it's, when it's wireless, most people don't exactly know where to go on their computer to do that. And that's an important thing to make sure that people understand. Um, some people think they, if, they get, uh, if they get away from one wireless situation, they're fine. No, there's other ones. And they, some of them go in automatically because they're set up that way to help a user. Uh -huh. So it's very important that people understand during response exactly who or how they should contact someone and what they should do in the meantime. So security awareness helps to take care of that. Ethics. Um, one of the things I can say about ethics that's really important is I had a boss, and I can tell you the company because it doesn't matter, all these people are gone now. I had a boss that we were having a problem <laughs> with a top level manager and the problem was we were trying to explain to him that he was putting the company at risk by one of his policies. So my boss said, well, what are we gonna do? I said, well, we have to tell him. And my boss said, well, if we don't tell him and something goes wrong, we can get more money. And I was thinking, yes, but that's not what we're paid to do. We're paid to advise, we're paid to make sure everybody knows what's going on. And it would be unethical of us not to do so. So we have to tell him. We did tell him, he didn't do anything, we still got the money. But now, but now our conscience is clear because we did the right thing. And that's really important when it comes to ethics. Some, sometimes you, you look at a bigger picture and think it'll be much better for us to do something or not do something that, would be, that might be unethical. Your reputation in this field is the only thing you have. Ethics is very, very important. Um, democracy, um, 
a lot of voices have good ideas. And one of the reasons that whenever we set up a system, most people want to close the system. They want to have a closed system that, oh, you can't go out to the internet, you can't go to this place, you can't go to that place. I, don't, I never agree with that because one thing is you'll get somebody who does something very good or very smart that you hadn't thought of if you let them go and, and explore and, and do what they want to do. But another thing is we're the ones who are supposed to protect them and we can't lose sight of that. So with, if somebody go, if um, we hear the voices, if we hear what people have to say, if we hear what problems people are having and listen to, and actually listen to that feedback, we're always gonna be a lot more secure because then we, we actually know what's out there. We can only think of so many things. And if one person can think of 10 things in a room where people can think of over 100 things, the more people you have, the more you can get done. So that's very, very important. Uh, risk assessment, I'll skip. Um, security design and implementation. Now we're tar starting to talk about critical infrastructures. And what I've noticed at ABB was, at first they had, you know, uh, they had a monitoring system that was monitoring uh, a, a ship or something, something of that nature. But then they were saying, hey, if we want to upgrade it, we always have to go out to that ship. Maybe there's an easier way for us to do it. Oh, we'll connect it to the internet. Well, some of, the, some of these systems, like SCADA systems, aren't made for that kind of security. But the convenience was so, so important to everyone that they just skipped past that. So now you have a lot of systems out there that have vulnerabilities that are so big that they're almost impossible to close because they're very expensive now to close. And most people just don't want to spend that kind of money. A lot of ABB's problems is they're, they're with the customers now. So they, since ABB is still responsible for the system, they would either have to pay for the upgrade themselves or convince a customer to pay for the upgrade. No customer is going to volunteer for that. So now you have very vulnerable systems out there, and that's what you have to be most, um, that's what you have to think the most about. That's why critical systems are becoming very, very important now, because people are starting to realize how, how vulnerable they are and realize that they can't just not do anything, which will take us back to responsibility. But again, I'll discuss that later. Security management, how people manage security and how they put security together. Um, vulnerability management for ABB is a problem because we don't handle it ourselves. We have it shipped out to IBM. IBM can be very good at it, but the way they manage it is they only can do, they can, they can only upgrade with our permission and on certain times of the day. So if we say, hey, you know, we have something, we have a, we have a server that needs to be patched, they'll say, well, we're sorry, it's Thursday, you have to wait until Sunday. <laughs> After we find out if we can patch it from somebody uh, on, on your team. It's like, no, 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 you, you have my permission, patch, 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 patch. Okay, great, we can patch on Thursday or on Sunday. Or we didn't get time this Sunday, we didn't get time this Thursday, so we're gonna have to push it to next week. And that's a serious problem. We had a contract with IBM that half of the countries had to follow. The other half did not have to follow. The half that didn't have to follow were always patched. They were always green. And they would laugh at us because we weren't patched. Now all of us are under the same contract and all of us are not green, let's just put it that way. So the way the, way the security is managed is very, very important. I say very, very important, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I've done this for so many years that it, it just makes me laugh at how much can be overlooked. And um, well, as you'll see, uh, I'll, be, I'll get into more points of that. And reassessment. Uh, and for, for that, I mean analysis and feedback. You really have to understand what's going on, what you're trying to do, and understanding how well it's working. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about that? Uh, I just have a question. I'm generally accepted principle of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. These are principles of cybersecurity? Uh, security awareness. Okay. In, in just in general. Security awareness. Mm. Any, also physical, right? Not only cyber. Yeah. That's what you imply, yeah. right? So. And that's, that's another thing. Um, <coughs> moving, like, the, from the history of security awareness, most of it was physical security. Mm -hmm. But then as you move into cyber, that's when you start to come into problems that people don't quickly understand because you can't complain, you can't really explain it with the physical world. For example, you go, you work at a warehouse. You come into work one morning, the warehouse is cleared out, and, you know, somebody's broken in and stolen something. You know to call the cops, you know that something's missing, you know what's wrong. If it happens on a database and somebody copies it, unless you can see the history and what's happened, you might not know anything's even gone before it's too late. 
And that's when you hear about pa passport leakage. Like, oh, my passport's been leaked. It's like, how'd that happen? And the passports, are, I mean, and the passports are still all there. Well, no, that's not what this is all about. So when you're com when you're comparing the physical world to the to the cyber world, you have to be careful about that transition because a lot of people still try to put everything back in the physical world. Um, I had <laughs> I had a story of, with a woman, and I was trying to explain to her that she's always at risk on her computer, and I and I compared it to locking her door at home, and she said, "Well, I don't lock my door at home," and I said, "Okay, where do you live?" And she told me, and I said, "When are you guys not home? Is there a time when nobody's home?" So now she's getting a little bit skeptical. <laughs> but but still, that doesn't really explain the cyber part. What I had to tell her was that, say for example, I had a I knew a guy that was a mailman or a milkman, and he checked every door he went to, and then when he found one that was open, he called somebody and they could come and rob you. That happens online all the time, because you have a script kitty that can just test ports and test computers and test servers all the time. So you have to look at it that way. But there's, when you go from physical to cyber, you always have to take one more step or two more steps, bless you, two more steps just so people really get a, a, a view of what's going on. <coughs> Problems with security awareness, and like I said, the, the, these are, have been my pet peeves for years. Um, when I started this, when I started in security, what, well, I, actually, I consider myself a business person, so I really started in business. And what I was told by my instructors was that, well, if you're going to be in business, you're going to have to know computers because they're going to be hand in hand soon. And if you can't talk both, nobody will be able to listen to you. You're going to have to know computers. Well, 30 years have gone by, and they're still just as separate as they were when I first started. Computers and business people still don't talk to each other the right way. So when I start talking about these problems, these are the kinds of things that I'll be talking about because I've, I've seen it for enough years. Problems with top management, problems with end users, and problems with security professionals. We're going to start with the problems with top management. Um, ignoring the threat is one big problem. And as, as you can see, um, this does not apply to us or we don't have anything worth stealing. When I worked for Plan Norway, they were saying, well, we're a, we're a help organization. Who would rob a help organization? We don't have any money here. We don't have anything here. And I'm like, do you realize you have the king's bank account here online? And it's just like, well, yeah, but what could they do with that? It's like, the king's <laughs> bank account. So it, it's really, it, it can be really hard. Same thing with the Tom Lega planning. We don't have anybody's information. Not only did they have everybody's uh, FOTSO number, you know, their social security number, basically, but they also made people sign in with that number. So all you had to do was see somebody sign in, and you knew exactly what was going on. And you, do, you only need three pieces of information about a person to have that person's um, identity. You need like um, their where they live, folks' number, and name. You got the whole you got the whole shooting map. So trying to convince people that that little bit of information is important was really really difficult. And I can't say was really is really. It still mm -hmm. is very very difficult. We finished security last year. We can't afford security. When I worked for a Plan International as a CISO. The question was, when will we be done with security? How long do you think it will take us to get security in place? It's like, what, what are you talking about? It, it's, it's a program. It, it's never in place. They're like, well, but when, when, when would you finish and say that we're at a, a good point to stop? Where, where, how long would that take? A year? Two years? I'm like, it will take five years. And they're like, why five years? I'm like, we're in 29 different countries. You don't even know where your information is. You don't know who has access to it. You don't know who has copies of it. We would have to figure out all that stuff. I left after six months. <laughs> Attempt to shift responsibility. Um, implicit ri risk acceptance. That's when I say you tell somebody, hey, this is a real serious problem. You've got to do something about it. OK, you've told me. And then they do nothing about it. People still do that. Um, scapegoating security professionals or end users. Sec security professionals, I kind of understand that because we are the ones who are supposed to be um, um, watchdogging everything. And if you say, oh, okay, I made a mistake, but I'm going to fire my security guy, yeah, that kind of comes along with the game. But the problem, the biggest problem is the end users. You can't just tell an end user, don't do this or you'll be in trouble. Because part of their job mm -hmm. is to go online. Part of their job is to use the computer. Part of their job is to take an email. Now, if somebody sends them a spam or a bad email and they click on it, you can't just say, well, you gave us a virus, you're fired. We have to protect them. That's not their job. 
So, and we have to make sure that they can protect themselves too. So that's where the awareness comes in. What could happen to you? What should you do when something happens to you? And not, you know, the stick like, okay, well, you did something wrong, we're gonna fire everybody. Because I can tell you, I work at a place, and I won't say which place this was, where the, the supervisor, the boss, actually did something like that, and he didn't go anywhere. So if it's good for one person, it should be good for everybody else. And if you're not gonna fire yourself, don't fire, don't fire, fire somebody who's a little man. So no clear understanding of responsibility is the biggest problem that top management has. They just don't understand. But again, security awareness should be telling them that. And I've still not really worked at too many places. Plan was one of them. I have to give them, um, I have to give them really good, um, um, really good standing, really good um, respect because I could actually go to a country manager. I can actually go to a regional manager and give them a security meeting, and they would take it and they would listen to what I had to say. They would, and a lot of them were very diligent about it. Once they found out how at risk they were. I got calls all the time about what can we do, what should we do, what, how do we do that? So some people are very diligent about it once they find out. But the whole point is to make sure that they get a chance to find out. Problems with end users. Um, not clear understanding of environment. Now again, people in this room, this, is not, this means nothing to you. But the difference between what's on a PC, local environment, and then the cloud, when you go to an office and a person's looking at that device, that's the whole thing to them. They don't understand what cloud means. They don't understand. I used to call servers in a different room. I used to call it the, the fog. I'm like, they don't know what the fog is. They don't know what the cloud is. They only know this PC. The fact that this PC can reach to the other part of the world is still not so clear to everyone. And we have to make that clear. Because one of the things I was trying to explain to a young lady was that if someone has access to your PC, they can access so many things around that you, you, we would never know who did it, and if we did find out who, who did it, it would be you. It would be from your computer. And she's like, well, you mean if I leave my computer here? I mean, what if I bring it home and do it? Is, is that okay then? It's like, no, because it's the same access. But I mean, and we're laughing, but they, I mean, when a person is a clerk, when a person is a lawyer, when a person's a doctor, all they can see is that the device in front of them. And without the awareness of what's going on behind that device, they have no clue. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that they understand that. And when, when you talk about local environment, do you mean like local physical environment or the locality of data on the machine? Well, like, well just lo like local servers versus um, I see. cloud servers. Right. But yeah, but lo local devices, even even um, people with, print, um, with the printer, we were trying to explain to them the go-to the go printers, yeah. why that was so important. And someone said, well, you know, I, you know, there's only 25 of us in the office. And I'm like, yeah, but I know how much money you make because your boss left your salary on the printer one time, and I had to return it to his office, and I looked at it. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't under any obligation not to, so I looked at it, and I know how much money you make. I'm not supposed to know that. I'm really not supposed to know that. Just an injection in terms of the, the, the go-to printers kind of thing, right? So um, I assume the debate is also uh, how to dispose of them properly, right? Because they all have internal hard drives. So yeah. if you do a scan, for example, right, they, they're, they have like, you know, 100 gig or whatever of hard drive. Right. And they basically retain the data, right, have a ring storage, right? So and basically I have the last 500,000 scans or whatever always stored on the hard drive. So yeah. and that needs to be dealt with, you and know, that's what they end of life. Now because they have the, the, ser the actual servers in the disk themselves and they're encrypting everything. And, okay. and, and it's like because of that. And now when they wanted to spend money on that, Everybody was just like, well, wow, that's going to be a lot of money. We have a lot of printers around. I'm like, well, first of all, yes, you do. Second of all, you were, you were supposed to go paperless when I started working here five years ago, and you have more printers now than you did then. Mm -hmm. You're not going paperless. Let me just tell you that much right now. But also, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but in terms of human nature, and especially the end users, aren't we just prone to do mistakes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say we have, as, as information security professionals, we have to protect people. That's our job to protect them. If you're going to fire somebody because they make a mistake, that'd be ridiculous. You'd end up firing everybody after after a while. <laughs> so it's like we have to protect them. It's security for everybody, and we have to protect their information as well. I mean, people say, "Well, I don't care. What do I care if somebody else's information gets stolen?" It's like it's your information too. Your bank is on there. Your social security number is on there. Mm -hmm. All your information for the that you use for the job is there. Sometimes they've collected information that they shouldn't have collected GDPR, that they shouldn't have collected that's on there. So 
none of this information should get out, mm -hmm. and some of it is yours, so you have to really understand that it's yours as well. Um, not clear about threats, that's pretty clear. Most oh. oh, sorry, so immersed into it. A lot of people are not clear about the actual threats like viruses and um, what can happen with passwords. Password leakages where passwords can get out to other places. My my boss now found out that his password got leaked on LinkedIn, for example, because he used his job password. I mean, he used his job password and his job um, ID. And it was like, I had to tell him, yeah, your, your name's out there. You have to change your password. He's like, well, I changed it a while ago, but how does that happen? I'm like, you gave them your password, the password got, you know, their account got hacked and they just took all the passwords and probably sold them on to other people. So that's, that's how that happens. But I mean, he didn't know. He really just had no idea that that could happen. And he's an IS person. He really, he's an, he's an IT person. Not sure what must be done. Um, for me, this is, um, this is something that we have to really focus on. Because it's, it's okay to tell a person, hey, you're at risk. But it's like, okay, so what do I do now? Oh, no, just, you're at risk, good luck, you know. No, we have to tell them, if you, if you feel that this has happened, if you see this, if, you, if, you, if somebody warns you about this, if somebody gives you this, be careful with it. Think about what you're doing with it. And I, I'm sure you've heard the stories about people leaving hard drives out and then people putting in their computer to see what's going on. I heard one that was really, to me it was ingenious. I don't know if you know those new, um, the, the vape machines that you can charge on your phone. Uh -huh. <laughs> there was a company that was giving them out for free, and they had viruses on them. Uh. They had key lo they had key loggers on them. So, yeah, there's a lot of you, you have to learn those things, and that was new to me. The the security person that told me that I was just like, what? When the, when did this happen? It's like, oh, it was right out in front of an IT company. They just started giving them out for free. They were none of them were charged, of course, and people started putting them into their computers. That was the end of it. Cool. That was the end of it. So. The awareness does help, and you have to understand, you don't put anything in your computer. Um, with ABB, I had to change some of their, their um, dialogue because they were saying, always check, off, always check before you um, take anything off of a hard drive. I'm just like, no, but if somebody puts something into the hard drive, you know, it's already over. You have to tell them not to put it in at all. They're just like, yeah, but they'll know. No, just tell them not to put it in at all. Trust me, it, it's the only way this is going to work, and people are still going to do it. Mm -hmm. So. You have to tell them not to put anything in the computer unless it's theirs. And unless it's been in their care for a long period of time, not something that was in a drawer for a while or anything like that. Um, people aren't sure about their role. The biggest problem I have with people about not sure about their role is people who just refuse to do security. They're like, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist. Why do I have to do this? It's just like, for the same reason you're a dentist and you lock your door. For the same reason that you carry your keys with you when you're a dentist. This is part of what the whole thing is. You physically, you lock doors. This is this is just a digital locking of doors. This is a digital lock. You know, um, taking your keys with you. All of that stuff is still the same, no matter if it's digital or physical. So you can't really separate yourself from it. Part of that is top management as well. It's information security. When you get a when you get an evaluation at work, it's never it's part of, it's never part of your job. Even me, as an information security person, information security is not on my job anywhere. Like as a, as a, as anything to evaluate me. So, you know, I have to do it because it's my job. But why would a lawyer have to do it? Why would anybody else have to do it? So, um, not sure what to expect from the organization. Again, if people are worried about if I do the wrong thing, I'm going to get fired, or if I do the wrong thing, I don't know what to do with it. That's, that's, a, that's a problem. So what I, what I try to explain to organizations whenever they try to say that people are the problem, yeah, people are the problem, but they're not a problem maliciously. You have to really be careful who you're calling a problem and what you're saying the problem is. It's like people make mistakes. People try to be helpful, you know? It's like, oh, somebody called me and said they needed this password for this, and they said it was really, really important. Well, you know, I thought I could help this person. People want to be helpful, and you have to be careful with that. Any questions? And then problems with security professionals. And I don't want to say problems with us, but things that we actually have to have to be aware of. Um, our role is not really understood by top management. 
Um, they were, one of the worst weekends I had working for ABB was there was a gentleman who was an engineer. He clicked on the wrong link, downloaded the file to our servers, right? So, you know, they call us and say, hey, what do we do? Call IBM, and IBM has an incident management team. So I was called, I think, every two hours that whole weekend saying, what's going on now? What's going on now? What's going on now? And I'm just like, IBM is working on it. Well, what, what are we going to do? It's like, we can't do anything. There's nothing. I can't jump in and do anything. You reported to me. I reported to IBM. IBM goes through their whole diagnostics. They go through the server. They check out everything. And then it, they'll tell us what's going on. And, you know, after, I think it, was, it took 36 hours before they found any problem. Because it was really, really well hit. And, it, and it, was on a, it was on a drive that shouldn't have existed, that did exist, and they were always talking about getting rid of it. But they never did. That's why it took them so long to find it, because the drive was not supposed to be there. So when they found it, they eradicated it. But the whole weekend, I was being called every two hours. And, and they were saying, like, OK, well, you know, um, I'll give you two hours. And then when the scan is done, we'll do this. It's like, yeah, but the scan might not be done in two hours. OK, three hours. It's, no. You know, <laughs> It, it's a scan. When it's done, it's done. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm just going to call in four hours, and then we'll just see where we are then. Call four hours later. Where are we? Still scanning. Okay, I'm going to call you back in two hours. <laughs> the worst weekend. When we finally cleaned that drive that wasn't supposed to be in the first place and that they were going to get rid of, that drive still exists. That was two years ago. So. So what I mean in, in those cases, right? That's an interesting um, um, experience, of course. But what's the lesson learned? How do you how do you communicate? Uh, um, you know, is there is there some some way that you can visualize? For example, I think it may just relate to the fact that people are unaware about uh, um, the processes that IBM have in place, right, right, to deal with this, right? Is that something that you then, as a response in terms of in terms of learning? Uh, communicate to your to, to that engineer and the like that you actually say, hey, this is how it works, just right. to give an appreciation. Okay, every time you send, basically think about it this way: you send a ticket because I have a problem. You automatically send a screenshot back, sh delineating the process, the whole exercise we go through, mm -hmm. along with the time. So to 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 have this situational awareness, right? To take the uh, give the individual the appreciation. Okay, this is going to take n hours because there is someone, a man in the middle that deals with this, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you having that experience in two years again, right? right? Well, so well, is there, is there this, this learning element that you in, introduce? Well, it's the, here's the thing. The engineer had no problem with it. He just took another ah. computer off the shelf and went ah, at it, which okay. is another problem, right. <laughs> because you have a computer on your shelf for two years that you haven't updated. <laughs> but we'll push that to the side. <laughs> the person who was calling me was my IS boss. Right. Somebody who knows the process, somebody okay. who knows how this goes. So. There's nothing more I can tell him about the situation. I'm like, you know, you signed the IBM contract. You know exactly what they do. You know the process. And it's just like, yeah, but what can we do now? It's just like, well, I know you want to do something. I know you want to jump in there and get something done. But there's nothing to do. The scan is what we do now. And then when the scan is done, then we move on to the next thing. We have the guy off the system. Nobody else is doing anything on the system. Nothing else to be done until IBM done, is done with your scan. OK, give you a call back in an hour. <laughs> so, that's good. The, the top management has to understand. Yeah. Um, security is viewed as a cost center. Finance, whenever they want to cut costs, but if somebody tells them they're going to cut 10%, they're just like, oh, yeah, what, is the, what are these IT guys doing? We, we, what is that project? What are you doing with that project? What are you doing with those PCs and stuff like that? Number one, we don't buy 10,000 PCs for our department. So you have to tell them that. It's like, these are your PCs, and this is your budget. We don't order that many PCs for ourselves. So if you don't think everybody needs a new PC, fine, then cut it. But don't, but don't say the IT department is costing you money because of PCs. Mm. If you forget to tell us that you're running a project that's going to have security implications, and then at the end we have to add security, you have added the cost yourself. That was a problem that you had. The cost of not doing it, if something happens, I can tell you. That's the MBA part of me, because I have an MBA. I tell them exactly what the cost is going to be. But still, somehow, we're the cost center. Mm. You wouldn't be able to do what you do with an IT system without security. Mm. We're not costing you money. We're mm. helping you make money. Mm. And not enough people say that, to, not enough people say that which, is, which is a shame. Training is seen as an inconvenience, mostly because it's not part of your job. 
Nobody sees it as part of their job. So anything extra is considered an inconvenience. And like uh, I put first aid there. When we talk about safety, safety is important to everyone. If somebody can get hurt, if somebody can be killed, of course people understand that. If information might disappear, no matter how valuable the information is, it doesn't carry the same weight. People don't look at it exactly the same way. And I'll tell you, whenever there's a uh, safety and security week, I mean like a safety and security, like personal safety and security week, the CEO of the company sends out a flyer. When it's information security, it's some lower level vice president of blah, 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 blah that sent out the, I'm like, why isn't the CEO caring about that? Oh, no, 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 but it's not security, it's not socks, it's not something that will get us in a lot of trouble. Well, yes it is, <laughs> but you know, it's still, it's still a hard sell for most people. Um, training outcomes are not measured appropriately. Most of the time, if we do security awareness training, what they want to know is how many, people, <laughs> how many people took the training. It's like, oh, we want to get up to 97%. Why? <coughs> what, what does that number mean? Um, well, you know, it's better than 95%. Okay. When you get up to 97%, do incidents go down? We don't know. Mm. Well, d the, does the work get better? Does anything else change? Oh, we don't know. Well, why do you want 97%? Mm. It's better than 95%. <laughs> Is it better than 95%? I mean, that, and that's the whole thing. It's like, you're harassing people to get up to 97%, mm. and your incidents are still going up. And the information about the incidents for us IT people are, is out there, so you would know if it's going up or down, but nobody's even looking at it. So you have to know what you're measuring and why you're measuring it. And not, most of it is just compliance. If we say that, oh, 95% of our people are trained to an auditor, mm. of course, auditor checks off something, and that's fine. It's just like, yeah, but those resources and that effort could be used to actually help you. That's what you're really looking for. Mm. And if you're not being helped, it's not worth it to the InfoSec guys, at least. Mm. So, so what security awareness provides? Uh, risk management for top management is like, they have to know the risks of an action. That's one of the bigger risks they have to understand. You can't just sit idly by and think, well, if I do nothing and something happens, at least I didn't try to step in and do something and it, and it failed. I did nothing, it failed. You do nothing and it fails, it's, it's somehow okay. Which is, it, which is bad thought, it's, it's ridiculous. And what are the responsibilities? If your information disappears, you cannot blame it on a clerk, you cannot blame it on an InfoSec guy. All information belongs to the CEO. If he doesn't understand that, he's not going to act on it. So it's very important for them to know that. And security awareness provides them with that information. Um, threat information and users like attack vectors, how, how, how spam works. How, um, how somebody physically getting to your computer can, can um, really give them a problem like with key loggers and things like that. And mitigation possibilities, which is a good focus because people, once you tell them the risks, they really do want to know what they can do. And they'll ask you questions like, oh, if I, if I, is there any way I can disable my USB so nobody can put something in when I'm doing this? Or can I get one of those screen things so that when I'm working in the, in the subway that nobody can look over my shoulder? Once you start telling people what's possible, that people can look and see your computer from a long distance away, they are willing to do something about it. But you have to give them the information. They have to know what to do. And avenues of communication for security professionals Learn how to communicate properly with each, other, with each level. Like I said, when you're talking to an end user, you have to talk to them like they don't understand how the system actually works. And you don't want to insult them, because some people do. Some people are very good with their computers. But not everybody is, and you can't assume everybody has your same knowledge. Um, when you're talking to an upper level, it's money. Just money. Don't talk about anything else but money. I mean, <laughs> they're really not interested in anything unless you can tell them how much they've saved, and even saving isn't that great. Um, soft dollars to a, a CEO means nothing. I saved, ten, I saved you $10,000, I don't care. I need to make $10,000. That's all they're worried about. So if you can tell them by not doing something security-wise it's gonna cost them money, then they listen to it. And learn how to communicate with each other. In the, in the, in the information security group that I'm in, we have seven different communications people working in that group and they don't know who each other are. So if I said, can you give me uh, you know, an overview of who's who and who works with what communication, nobody knows. 
So how good can the communications be? Mm. How can we warn people about something that we've seen? Oh, we, mm. we saw something here, we've seen something there. <coughs> well, who do I tell? Well, uh, I told this person. Who's that person? So people don't know who each other are. Mm. So we, we're not doing very well communications. So we have to be a little bit better about that. Theories, and this is what brings, this is where I was thinking about the, the gaming part of what we do. More engagement helps the learning process. Like I, I said, our security awareness right now is just things pop up on the screen, yet you do some matching or something, and then you get to the end, you have to take a test, you need 80% or 75%, and then you're done for the year, don't have to think about it anymore. We need more engagement and we need more feedback so people understand like when you call when you talk about something that they understand what you're talking about. Oh, somebody put a duck on the side of my computer. What's a duck? You know, if you can't ask that question very quickly, oh a duck, it's a it's a USB that somebody puts a key logger on. They just shove it into your computer, you won't even know it's there. When you see it, you'll throw it away or something, but the key logger's already on there. You have to be able to explain that stuff. Um, changes in attitude leads to changes in behavior. Like I said, once you're aware of something. Now you, now you can actually do something about it. Now you can actually look for some more information. You can go online, you can ask more people. But without the information, you can't have an attitude change and you can't have that lead to a behavioral change. Storytelling helps the learning process. Um, I try to put stories in as much as I can. <laughs> uh, and modularity makes um, learning more convenient. Um, you don't want to give somebody an eight hour briefing. The military does that once a year, eight hours, they're trying to tell you one topic and expecting you after eight hours to retain anything. So break it down into smaller groups. When I used to give a security awareness training, what I would do is they wanted it a whole day. And I said, it has to be broken up over two days. And both days have to be before lunch. I would not do anything after lunch. And everybody knows you can't, anything that happens after lunch, it may as well not happen. So two days, both mornings. That's how I did it. And <laughs> an iterative learning is important. The more times people hear the same thing, it's just like learning a language. The more times you hear the same thing, the easier it is for you to learn. Mm -hmm. So we try to do it that way. That's all. Questions? Cool. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the talk, <laughs> but that's uh, pretty insightful. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, quite quite an impressive overview of security awareness. You guys first. Any questions you have? Hmm. Uh, you mentioned some theories uh, or uh, uh, coupling it with security. Do you think uh, the uh, including games in security awareness kind of uh, um, distantiates the mm -hmm. from the real problem? So like it becomes more serious or not as uh, no, no, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, what I want to do with, uh, with my, my um, actual master team is uh, really engage people in these kind of systems. Because like I said, end users don't really see what's going on. And when you say something's in the, uh, in the cloud, something's in the server, they only look at a computer. I want to try to simulate a game where they're actually, they actually see the whole system when they're at their, their computer. And when they do something, they can see where it goes. And oh, there's, now there's a problem, there's a virus, and do this, and separate I'm hoping it works out, we'll, we'll see. But, but like I said, um, if you can, if, when you want to go from physical to um, digital, you have to take a few more steps. And I think a project like this would take it a few more steps so that when a person sits down at their computer and they want to have an idea of a simulation, they can go out and look at the simulation and say, oh, okay, the cloud doesn't really mean it's up in the sky someplace. And pe I mean, it, it sounds funny to even say something like that, but people are just like, where in the sky is it? Is it like in a satellite or something? And I'm like, well, no, it, it, it's in a room, just like our servers were. And it's just like, oh, our servers were in a different room before? And it's like, yeah, servers were in a different room. Everything's not going on on your computer here. Oh, well, I save everything to that H drive, so that's on my computer, right? No, that's actually a server someplace else that, that, you're, that your drive sees like a normal thing. And people just don't know. I mean, it, it sounds funny because we've been sitting through this for so many years. It's, it's second nature to us, but it's so second nature that we step over people with that information, and we have to make sure that they know. Because nobody wants to be look like as, as they're being foolish. Uh, do you have any theories on why people don't necessarily value their credentials? So like, I have one 
uh, theory where I feel like uh, the common folks don't think they're important enough, enough to be hacked. Mm -hmm. So like they're like, oh my, my password is leaked amongst a million other users. Mm -hmm. it, it will never reach me. Why don't people like uh, value their credentials higher? I think one problem, I mean, one problem is when it's on the computer, they kind of, they either think it's safe or they just don't think about it anymore. But another one is, how many times do you actually have to give out your credentials? You give them out a lot to people. And it seems like you're, what you're doing is give, just giving it to anybody that asks for it. But a bank needs it. Your job needs it. You know, certain places need it. But you're so used to giving it out to people that you just think, well, it's out there anyway. So they probably have access to it anyway. Why, why should I worry about the access that they have here? Well, trust me, the banks <coughs> do worry about the access they have. So you have to kind of worry about the same access. One question, uh, some questions I have, and that's of course um, putting a bit of the teacher cap on here. But um, uh, so you, you're talking a lot of based on your experience here, yeah. right? So is there because there's a lot of interesting facts there, especially for information security. If you want to do research on this or attack this, um, possibly from a gamification angle, but also just from a research an an angle uh, generically, mm -hmm. is there any substantiation of those those um, um, those, those claims? Uh, you, you, uh, you, you mentioned before that. Um, there's a lack of metrics in terms of uh, assessing training outcomes and things right. like this, right? Mm -hmm. So did you come across any literature that, you know, that, that substantiated, or do I need to wait for you to write a paper? I, I've, come up, I've, I've read some, and I've come up with some, and I'm, what I'm trying to do yeah. right now is put them together to see if I can get a really good one. Like, for yeah. example, with this paper, they, they did see some correlation between training and, uh, and what they did, but not necessarily causation, and that's what I was really really interested in. So I was like, okay, it's like if a person, well, I had a, I had a teacher that was a programming teacher and I was like probably the worst programmer of all time, even though I worked as a programmer for years. But I, I had a teacher and what he was saying was he would never get out extra credit. And you know, at the beginning of the class he says that. It's like, well, why not? What if somebody needs a couple of points to pass? He's like, listen, the only people who do extra credit are the ones who can already do the programming. The ones who need the extra credit can't even get through the regular stuff, so they can't get to the extra credit anyway. So what am I giving extra credit for? So, you know, <laughs> when you when you start to look at when you start to look at those things like causation versus correlation, you have to be you have to be careful of okay, were these people so good at the beginning that they would have, you know, would, they were so good with the computers anyway that they would have done really well, and they're not really learning anything at all. It, not not the reverse, like the paper says it's kind of the reverse. Mm. <clears throat> but I think that the people didn't learn how to be good at computers and then it helped them. Mm. I think they already knew how to be good and then that just carried through. They were able to ride on top of that to get better grades. So That's sensible. But I think it's also, a, I mean, in a professional environment, a sensible discussion, uh, uh, perhaps I'm thinking more your report already, a future ahead, uh, 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 to be had, right? So how do you, you know, those could be potential uh, pathways as yeah. to, you know, um, uh, how you would need to adjust the, your metrics to, to identify individuals based on their demographics, based on their you know background in mm -hmm. a way, uh, do they have a computational background or not, how many years have they worked in this area and, not, and then use this to calibrate this right. against the training experience? Right, because they just, they just took students and they didn't have any kind of pre-notion about what the students were yeah, yeah, and then they, at the end they said, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Yeah. If they had done that at the beginning, they probably would have had a clearer picture yeah. and you would have probably seen a better correlation. Well, I think we come back to the, to the, to the specific paper. I'm, I'm more thinking about generally the claims you make. Mm -hmm. Right now, already in the talk, oh, because it's okay. full of experience. Like yeah. you said, you, you use storytelling, you use the inductive approach, basically, from ex, ex, you know, generalizing from an example, basically, right? Mm -hmm. to, to give us an appreciation uh, uh, or kind of an intuitive appreciation of the problem that you're having in workplaces, for right. example, and then generalizing, oh, yeah, because you had the experience, most likely you have experience here as well, and, and so on, right? So, but it would be good to, to um, uh, especially again, looking for your report, at your report in the future, they, you, they need to substantiate those claims, right? Or be clear about this, this personal experience, right? To some yeah. extent. Uh, but uh, since we're looking at the scientific pe perspective, sorry, it's always <laughs> been a bit driven by, by, by theoretic uh, substance in a way, right? So, but it's really, really interesting and really insightful to, 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 um, to, to get a deeper appreciation. Do you have any questions regarding this? Because I was thinking all while he was talking about your work to some mm -hmm. extent, because there's so much interrelationship, so you yeah, guys yeah. should probably talk after the session. Um, yeah, I'm sure. In, in terms of because you really have a really a practitioner lens on it, something we really get. So we have to make <laughs> use of it, right? So we, we kind of drill you probably. 
with respect to that. I've been doing it since the 1900s, so it's, yeah, it's yeah, been yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah. So you're, 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 you're out there for, for quite some time already. That's cool. No, that's cool. Um, yeah, in terms of um, the, um, abstractly, again, coming not going directly to the specific paper, I'll come to that in a second because I would like to include the group in the discussion. Did you, would you, based on your experience, intuitively come up with a um, game or serious game concept that you would have in mind that you think would work uh, to increase security awareness? Well, I, like I said, I, I, what I really want to do is try to build a simulation yeah. or use a tool that has a simulation and then just kind of make, um, surround it with you know, a real work situation for end users. But I'm not quite sure if I'm versed enough to do that on my own. So that's, that's where we are with that. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure if I can pull off the actual prototype. So. Yeah, but you can still conceptualize it, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's. Um, but I don't know if that'll be enough for my my master's thesis. So that's yeah. something you probably need to discuss. I mean, but I, I think even even for uh, this course would be a potential option, right? We have this option apart from doing literature review also to construct or conceptualize. Yeah, and games. I, I thought about if actually doing that. you don't need to necessarily come up with a prototype because we, there's no explicit requirement of programming anyway. But right. but but having you know. Um, giving us a, a clear visualization of how you think, a, given your experience, how a security, uh, or sorry, a serious game or a gamification of security awareness could work in your view, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's sometimes, uh, it's really easy and you make it easy for us to follow your intuitions, right? right? And the insights you got, but you know, how do we actually improve on it, right? Yeah. So other than communicate, communicate, because on the other hand, you can also say iterative learning is important. Well, there's the thing with iterative learning, um, we, we talk about motivational theories, it can be really boring after yes. some time because we have 50% of the room that actually have some IT background and kind of read magazines on their own, are somewhat current, mm -hmm. and the other 50% that uh, have no clue and they kind of need this iterative uh, uh, reinforcement, right? So how do you keep them in, engaged as opposed to having the others drift off and actually the seeming the IT uh, savvy being behind because they would stop attending those, those yes. you know? And, uh, it, and, that, and that is a challenge. I mean, I, like I said, a lot of the research I've been doing is talked about when it gets boring and what they and what other people have done and I'm trying to synthesize that to see if it's something that cool. I can actually do so I mean yeah I've, I've been trying to put this all together but I just don't know without knowing if I can produce a prototype I don't know if I can get to an end product and that might hurt me so I'm trying to right, see right. either if I can do it or if I don't do it how yeah. far I need to take the actual research to make sure that it's still acceptable it's probably so we discussed with the responsible for the uh, in your case information security program yeah. right how far you can push it but I think the, I see great value there because you can link you have the unique experience um, uh, not only unique experience but you can link theory and practice right yeah. so and that's something we really see so yeah. Uh, if you put this on, you know, with sufficient theoretical backing, then I think there's an ample opportunity to bring in your practical experience. Yeah. Particular serious gaming invites for that, right? Yeah. So because you can just int introduce mechanics that are not ad hoc, but they are grounded in, 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 in individual instances, yeah. right? So in individual cases, and put them in the scenario of you, I don't know, interacting with your laptop or someone approaching you saying, here's my USB stick, please copy the pictures, yeah. and uh, you know, seeing how the person responds to those requests randomly, right? right? Well, yeah. And so I, yeah, exactly, and, that, and that's what I really want to do to make it that to make it that way, and to make it to, so that you can update it with new things because that's one of the problems we have. So yeah. New threats come out, and we still have the one year thing going on. So we really need something that we can update on the fly. Yeah. And if people go through the same motions again, they're a little bit different each time. So even though it's iterative, there's still a change going on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. You had a question, I believe. I saw your hand. Uh, I no comment. Two or Go for it. building on the first thing you said, um, building a serious games with security awareness. I think you have to be really careful about who your audience is, mm -hmm. because as Simon said, a uh, tech savvy uh, person might find it uh, really cool mm -hmm. but, or uh, easy. Uh, mm -hmm. While I'm uh, a clerk or a, a kind of normal end user could either find it really abstract or uh, really hard to learn. Mm -hmm. Like then you have to employ the iterative learning, but like who your target group is. Uh, will di dictate how the game will turn out, mm -hmm. and I don't think it can be both. Well, the thing is, I, I didn't. What I didn't want to do was make it a mandatory thing for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think what it should be: you have your mandatory training, the boring one-year thing. But this is for people who really want to try to figure out something new, or they know they have a they a misunderstanding of the system, and they can really understand a little bit more. Even if I did it a little bit differently for top management, I would probably try to incorporate the risk and like how much a server cost and that kind of thing. Oh, you did this, now the server went down. This is gonna cost you this much money because that's what they're interested in hearing. So, I mean, I, it, wouldn't, it couldn't be just one, well, it couldn't be one module. 
there would have to be different modules that people could use, but I wouldn't make it mandatory because they already have a mandatory compliance thing. If you if that's good enough for you, fine. If it's not and you want a little bit more and you're you know, if the security awareness is peaked, you're you, you really are getting an interested attitude about it, then you have something else that you can go to that can help you. And you can do it on your own. So. I like uh, in the paper they did um, automatic capture, or the flags, they automatically uh, graded, mm -hmm. and they included uh, written uh, assignments about um, getting a hold of the understanding, uh, and had lectures. And I think to uh, develop incentric motivation in the users, including uh, awareness sessions <coughs> to build kind of like, um, I will do this game mm -hmm. because my credentials are at risk, or um, I'm prone to attack. So, like, including both awareness sessions and the game mm -hmm. to build the centric motivation could be nice. Cool. Our thoughts, questions regarding presentation more generally? I, not really about paper, but more about your experience, really. Because uh, there are some stories online, like, uh, about from security professionals, where they they get hired, they like do their job properly and stuff. Mm -hmm. So security like not threats but uh, uh, accidents mm -hmm. go down, right? Yeah. Uh, so the CEO starts asking why they're employing the security professionals because nothing is happening anymore. Right. Because the security professionals are keeping everything updated and such. Right. So th they fire the security professionals and yeah. then the accidents just go up again for some reason. And <laughs> and, that, and that's kind of what I talk about communication. That's kind of our problem. If, if your manager walks past you and asks you what you're doing, you say nothing, he should fire you. If you say, I'm saving you money, if you say, I'm keeping the, you know, the threats down, or we had this problem last week, but we were able to solve it, that's what you're really <coughs> supposed to be saying. But I, I, look, I'm, a, I'm an, a geek. I'm, an, I'm kind of a business IT geek. And I was one of those guys that would just want to, wanted to just walk past the balls and sneak past the balls all the time. But it's not good for our profession. It's not good for people who really need to do that. So. You really have to speak up and tell people what's going on. The same thing with outsourcing. Most people think, oh, you know, this company says that they can do it cheaper than the people we're paying right now. And it's just like, yes, but what they're going to do is very limited. The people you're paying right now live here. You know, they, this is their business. If you want to work, want to work them overtime to move your servers one time, they're going to work. If you do that with a with a contractor, it's going to cost you so much more money. And I know most people now that have outsourced, within like three years, they've insourced. So, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it comes down to saying the right things to the right people so that they understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when it's top management, it's money. It's money. It's done. done. Don't disillusion all the guys here right now. <laughs> no, no, but th th that's the best part. Once you know how to speak money, then it doesn't matter. As soon as you tell them how much you can save them or how much, the, how much not doing something will cost, you don't have to say anything else. And our problem is we want to talk about the cool toys and what we've set up and what it gets in the way of and how many firewalls and how they speak to each other. How much money did you save? How easy did you make it for somebody to make you money? Oh, the sales force can go out now and they don't have to worry about anything with their computer. They can take it anywhere and it will work. They can go anywhere? Yes. That's how you, that's how you, tell, that's how you talk to them. Sounds good. Cool. You can say that uh, they are paying you to not talk to them about security, mm. but to do security. Like sys admins, right? So yeah. So that's that, yeah. That's the advantage of like having a consultant firms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is that when you work for them, you're a source of income yeah. instead of a source of uh, yeah expenses. Yeah. So, so then you're looked at in a completely different way. I know. Uh, I think uh, not a uh, computer wise, but then uh, uh, hydro. Uh, the Norwegian company, they outsourced every cleaning service they had right. to an, uh, its own company. And then they s they felt uh, much more appreciated because they stopped being a, a, a source of like, oh, you're costing us so much money. Yeah. And, and they become like, you know, you're making us money. Mm -hmm. So they felt like more appreciated because they were making money for the company instead of wasting money for the yeah. company even though they were doing the exact same thing. But I mean, I've seen companies that even kind of right now their own IT people as consultants to other companies yeah. because now they're making money. Mm. But I mean, the money that they save you should be enough because 
the money is being saved. We just never really talk about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I'm in both fields is because I was told years ago that they were going to kind of merge and you had to know both. They're still running kind of parallel, unfortunately. So we have to be able to talk to the other people. Yeah. And I think, uh, especially in such a, a knowledge-heavy field, knowledge preserving in the company. Mm -hmm. So like when you outsource stuff, you basically outsource your knowledge because when that contracts adheres, nobody in your company knows what to do anymore. And you talked a bit about like coverage percentage of employees being through certain courses. Like when you outsource, you diminish the uh, percentage in your company just because they preserve the knowledge and not you. So the knowledge is uh, an indirect value for the consulting company right. and like, uh, not for your company. And they, and they have to keep you weak because the consultants can't tell you that information because you want to do it yourself, of course. So they know exactly how weak to keep you, and that's a really bad thing. Another thing about IT, like I, when I worked with Plan International, some people love the company. When you love the company you work for, you don't mind traveling all, you know, six months a year. You don't mind working on weekends to get some stuff done. And no, even if they pay you overtime, they're never going to pay you the amount of overtime that they would pay a consultant for a regular day's work. Mm. So if you can't, if you have people that love your company, why are you outsourcing it to somebody that has nothing to, to gain but money from you? Mm. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, that's so it becomes a real industry talk here right now. <laughs> so you know, definitely not going to experience best learning, which is good. <laughs> but now, me as the coercing party is sorry for that. <laughs> Bringing it back. Um, do you guys need a break first of all? And mostly William, do you need a break? Um, Ten is minutes. Place to get water. Is yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so here, actually, yeah, meeting room benefits. We actually have cups, so feel oh, free to use them. I don't know if you want to use that term. Anyway, um, so but I Thanks. can admit you to the um, toilet here. Hang on. Um, I have my car. So, <coughs> so let's, let's take a five, <coughs> minute, five <coughs> minute break or so. Feel free to grab some, uh, you know, um, water or the like. You can use this. Oh. Yes, yes, just help him in. The toilet is on the right side. It's uh, Kilo. So slightly different dynamics than expected, but uh, I think that's the uh, so slightly different from what I expected. Uh, yeah, I think so. But it's actually very good for you. And I lost something. I think. Um, <coughs> I think uh, there, there's something interesting for you in there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, um, because you can get a lot of practitioner claims, right? So, uh, you know, narratives and um, uh, motivations. So, you know, for, for, for you, what, what are sensible mechanics to accommodate <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, right? So, and perhaps there's even a <coughs> opportunity for, for mutual, you know, for, for William to think about his thesis in this context mm -hmm. and you in the... Um,